Okay, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, my name's Sam. I'm the president of Giving What We Can, and I'm also working uh, with technology at the Centre for Effective Altruism. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to be here today with Ian Basson. Uh, Ian is the Chief Operating Officer of Give Directly, uh, which I'm sure many people in the room would know about. Um, uh, and I'll get Ian to explain a bit more about Give Directly's uh, role. Um, Ian has previously served as an Assistant Counsel to Barack Obama um, and also to New York Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio. Uh, he's also uh, helped scale up uh, online community of arts, uh, grow it into the 42 million, million member community that it is today. Uh, and of course, uh, Give Directly are uh, best known for their unconditional cash transfer program, which has been running for several years. And today we're actually going to talk about uh, what might be the next evolution in that program, uh, which is the, uh, the project to uh, experiment with and, and perhaps scale up a universal basic income uh, in certain places. But I'll hand over to Ian uh, to talk to us uh, a little bit about um, yeah, what Give Directly's current work, are, uh, what work is and uh, how that relates to universal basic income. Um, thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, so Give Directly, for those who are not familiar, um, gives away unconditional cash transfers to the extreme poor. So that's cash, no strings attached. Um, why do we do that? There is a robust evidence base uh, behind the effectiveness as, of cash uh, as an anti-poverty tool. I, I actually assume probably a lot of people here are familiar with it, so I'm not going to go into that evidence. If you're curious about reading a lot of it, a lot of it you can find on our website. Um, but I think what's underlying uh, that evidence is a fundamental truth. Um, there's, a, there's a famous exchange, it might be apocryphal, uh, between um, Fitzgerald and Hemingway, uh, where Fitzgerald says, you know, the rich are really different than we are, and Hemingway says, yes, I know, they have more money. Um, and, and I think Give Directly is really the inverse of that, which is that the assumption is that the poor are different than we are in that they have less money. They're not deficient. They don't have different sets of fundamental priorities. Their humanity is not different. Um, and so we don't need to do all sorts of remedial things uh, like training and resetting of priorities often. Um, we can actually get very far by giving the poor cash, um, and they use it quite well. Um, uh, the, so what we do is we do those transfers, but there's a bigger idea behind it, um, which is this idea that uh, Brookings estimates that we could actually close the global poverty gap with about 65 to $80 billion a year. That would be to get everybody above $1.90 a day. We spend about 130 to 140 billion a year. We're spending more than it would take to end extreme global poverty, um, which creates this wonderful opportunity, uh, which is that we could be the generation that ends extreme global poverty if we can figure out the mechanisms to do it because we, we have the resources. Um, and that brings us to this idea of universal basic income. Um, which is there are those out there that think either presently or at least sometime in the near future we will have enough abundance um, that we will be able to prevent anyone from falling below a certain level. Um, we do micro grants, not micro loans, but to borrow an idea from Muhammad Yunus, um, poverty should be something that you find in a museum. Right? We should have grandchildren who ask us how could you possibly have had this much and allowed some people to have so little. And the idea of a basic income is could we actually have a floor below which nobody can fall. Now fundamentally, a basic income is a cash transfer. It's a transfer to people to make sure everyone has a floor. Um, at Give Directly, we run research on cash transfers. So as this debate about whether a basic income would be an effective measure has been playing out, it occurs to us that we're in a, a pretty good position to test it. Um, we work with the extreme poor in East Africa. Um, we run rigorous randomized controlled trials on interventions with the poor. We do it with cash transfers. We have uh, several hundred staff overseas to go and implement this. So we thought we'd be in a very good position to go and test this idea of a basic income. So that's what we're going to set out to do starting later this year. Cool. Um, I should just mention, um, uh, you can see on the slide here, uh, the instructions for if you'd like to submit questions. We'll have about uh, five or 10 minutes uh, opportunity for questions at the end of the session. And then after that, Ian will be next door uh, to take any further questions if we don't get to them all uh, right now. Um, so what's, I guess, the motivation uh, at the moment for uh, looking at UBI? What do we already know about this kind of uh, program, what do we need to know? Yeah. Well, we know a lot about cash transfers generally. Um, we know that people use them generally to increase their earnings, to increase their assets. We've seen in the range of studies increases in education and healthcare outcomes. Um, but most of those are on short-term transfers. And most of those are on targeted transfers, where you're targeting a specific population. What a universal basic income is that's somewhat different is it's three elements. First, it's universal, which means it's not means-tested. 
Um, second, it's enough to live on. It's basic. It's a subsistence level. Um, and third is it's regular and in perpetuity. Um, and those, each of those things kind of tees up interesting questions within the development space. On the universal one, um, do you, is it regressive when you're universal and you're not targeting the most needy? Or by targeting everyone, do you actually eliminate certain stigmas that are attached to receiving assistance? Do you create greater uh, political will behind something? Do you eliminate what are known as sort of the welfare cliffs or poverty traps, where in current welfare systems, if you earn above a certain amount, you go out and get a job, you might lose your benefits. Does the idea of you being guaranteed an income regardless of work mean that you eliminate some of those disincentives to climb up the ladder? Those are all interesting questions and trade-offs that testing the universal program will hope to, hope to uncover. Um, on the idea of subsistence and basic, uh, there was a trial that was run in India where they deliberately set the income level below subsistence because they were worried that if they made it at subsistence, it would be a disincentive to work. Um, there's research out there suggesting that cash transfers do not create a disincentive to work, but knowing about whether that subsistence level makes a difference uh, is another thing that is sort of interesting to debate. And then the in perpetuity one goes to this question of social protection versus graduation. Um, you know, our cash transfers that give directly are short-term large capital lump sum transfers and the idea that that could be catalytic to get people out of sort of the cycle of dependence. But what if we really do need something that's more of a general protection in the long term? And what are the trade-offs between those two? So these are all some of the questions that you want to tease out when you look at a universal basic income. For sure. So one of the things I think that's quite interesting about uh, basic income and, and the idea of a universal basic income and certainly in the way the debates uh, evolved over the last uh, little while, last year or so, uh, has been that it seems to attract support uh, from all, all sides of the political spectrum. It seems to be something that uh, whereas uh, people on, you know, the, say the, the social left might have a particular view of welfare, libertarians might have another view um, about how the implementation looks. It seems that universal basic income is something that's starting to attract support from, from all quarters. Do you, do you think that that's true and, and do you uh, have any insight as to why that might be the case? Yeah, I mean, there certainly is a broad base of people who are interested in it. Um, everyone from, as you note, sort of on the very progressive left, those people who are in favor of greater redistribution of wealth, um, greater generosity towards those at the bottom through direct redistributions, um, to those on the sort of libertarian right, very concerned about the, the heavy hand of a very bureaucratic welfare state looking at basic income possibly as a way to replace uh, sort of the, the panoply of government programs that create a larger bureaucracy. Um, to those in the technology world who are looking at things like artificial intelligence, robots and automation as fundamentally changing the labor market and see basic income either uh, as a way to ameliorate some of those potential effects or in one case there's a venture capitalist Albert Wenger um, who talks about basic income as a way to accelerate some of those things because the human brain is capable of more than driving a truck across the country and shouldn't we give enough leverage uh, to someone in some of those jobs to be able to accelerate automation so that they can go and achieve a greater level of human flourishing. So that's created this very interesting coalition. The other thing to say about basic income is I think, and this is rapidly changing, but really if you go back four to six months ago, I mean that's how fast it's changed, there was this notion that this was a utopian, pie in the sky idea that was utterly impossible whether that be practically or politically. Um, what people don't realize is that we almost had something like a universal basic income in the United States in the early 1970s under Richard Nixon, of all people, pushed something called the Family Assistance Plan, um, which was a negative income tax that would have guaranteed every family in the country a minimum, essentially, of $10,000 a year based on principles that were put out there by the conservative economist Milton Friedman. A um, lot of interesting sort of fun political mm -hmm. history behind that, the, the people behind it from yeah. uh, Daniel Moynihan to Don Rumsfeld who were all organizing. It passed the House of Representatives and died in the Senate. Um, so to those who think this isn't either practically or politically possible, I think the history would belie that, the coalitions would belie that. Um, and also, uh, important to note that you do not need to adopt a basic income in its fullest form for it to be something potentially of interest. Um, our interest at Give Directly is really more in whether this idea of broad-based cash transfers can be an effective means of combating poverty, particularly in the developing world. And you could take pieces of universal basic income, whether it's something that's geographically targeted, um, whether it's something that is sized at different amounts, and apply them in different ways. It's not really an all or nothing policy. For sure. So uh, would you say that you've got um, a good idea of where this is going to go? I mean, uh, what's the scale of the, the project likely to have to be before we get the kind of evidence that you're, you're going to need uh, to say that 
this works or that this doesn't work. Um, so, so we're going to run a randomized control trial on a universal basic income. Now, there have been pilots on basic income in the past. Um, in the 70s in the U.S., there were about four pilots in four different cities. Um, in Manitoba, Canada, they ran a short-term pilot. There are others that are either underway um, in Utrecht in the Netherlands or Finland is talking about doing one for about two years. Um, all of these pilots um, have generated some learnings, but most of them have been pretty short-term. Um, two years or so as the Finland one is, or even up to about four in the, in the Canada example. And one of the important differences between what we think is important to learn and some of these pilots are, do people make fundamentally different life decisions when they know they're, they're going to have a guaranteed income over the long term? If you find out that you're going to have a guaranteed income for about two years, I suspect that most of us are probably not going to drop our jobs, change our lives, mm -hmm. pursue a different career, go back to school. It's just not a long, long enough guarantee to allow us to make those fundamentally different life decisions. So importantly, we are going to be promising uh, and delivering a basic income payment to families who are all living under $2 a day uh, in East Africa for 12 years. Um, there'll be three arms where people are receiving the payment. There'll be a 12-year arm where people are going to receive the equivalent of about 75 cents a day, roughly, which is about the food poverty line in East Africa. Um, there'll be another arm that's just a two-year arm, so you'll actually be able to tell specifically the difference between having something guaranteed over the long term and something guaranteed under the short term. And then there'll be an arm that's more like the Give Directly traditional program of a short-term large lump sum transfer. So you'll be able to see some of the differences between that lump sum approach and the more extended, smaller payments over time approach. And then, of course, it's, it's an RCT, there'll be a control. Uh, overall, there'll be about 200, right now we've got enough funding to do about 200 villages uh, in the treatment arms. Um, we'll be treating all of the individual adults uh, in that population. That will allow us, at about 200 villages, um, to detect uh, effects on some of the fundamental questions on the economic side, things like how do peop what are, what's people's changes in consumption, um, how do they ch spend their time. What we're not yet powered to be able to detect are some of the more um, sort of nuanced potential effects on things like people's psychological well-being, gender relations, aspirational outlook on life. To do that, we're going to need to raise an additional amount, which we're looking to raise before the end of the year, so we can actually include about 300 villages. Then we'd be powered up to about the 90% level to be able to look at some of these sort of nuanced effects. Overall, the project's about a $30 million project. We've raised about um, 21 or so of it. If any of you have been part of that, thank you on behalf of the people who will receive it. Um, and we'll look to do the rest by the end of the year. Fantastic. Now, given where the trials are going to be um, located in East Africa, do you think that there's scope to sort of generalize any of these findings to elsewhere in the world? So whether that be other developing contexts or in fact to a, to a developed world context. I mean, we've talked about uh, pilot programs in, in places like Utrecht. Do you think that, that universal basic income is something that, that will uh, transcend the, the local economic context? I mean, first off, you have, to, you have to understand that any context is going to be different, right? Sure. So the way that a basic income plays out in a place like Kenya is going to be different than the way it plays out in Switzerland and the United States. However, at root, what we're really looking at here and some of the fundamental questions over which the most heated debates are mm -hmm. taking place yeah. is, is the effect of this on human psychology such that the sky falls, yeah. right? Do people simply stop working, right? That's the big fear. I think those types of fundamental human questions about what sorts of incentives um, does a UBI create, you will be able to make some, some generalizations about. So um, our study uh, is going to be researched by uh, a really terrific team of investigators, including uh, Abhijit Banerjee from MIT, uh, Tavneet Suri from MIT, and Alan Kruger, uh, President Obama's former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, along with two of GiveDirectly's founders, uh, Michael Fay and Paul Niehaus. Um, Abhijit Banerjee did a study at MIT where he looked at cash transfer programs around the world and the impact that they had on labor participation and found that there was no evidence that cash transfers decreased labor participation. And that was in, I think, his study was probably about six different countries or so. So there are some things that have been consistent across different contexts about how people behave when they receive cash transfers generally. So now I think that what we find out in terms of how people behave when they receive cash transfers over the long term is going to be something you can generalize. How it has how it interacts with existing social programs, existing benefit schemes, that's obviously going to change a lot in different places. Yeah. Um, what do we see, uh, I guess, in, in the cash transfer space? There's obviously the, 
direct economic benefit that, that recipients get. You can buy a better quality roof for your house, you can buy better quality food. Do you, with, with cash transfers, do you see longer term benefits in terms of education, uh, health, that sort of thing? And would you expect these to transfer over to UBI? Would you expect there to be different long term benefits to UBI beyond the actual the economic benefits? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the initial things that you probably expect to see, I mean, right off the bat, uh, a cash transfer directly, you know, sort of ameliorates poverty by providing mm. people cash, right? That's the, yep. that's the wonderful simplicity of it. So yep. you would expect to see uh, consumption immediately go up. Mm. Um, I think some of the differences between long-term and short-term that you might expect to see, um, you might expect to see some of the money um, used more on investment than consumption, um, presumably because people will have had the ability to take care of basic needs because of the steady income mm. flow. Um, but of that investment, um, you might see um, perhaps higher returns on the first amount because if someone who's receiving a large lump sum uh, is able to invest a lot of it, probably the first places they invest are the highest return places. Mm -hmm. So does, does the fact that people are sort of investing a, a lesser amount mean that as a slice, it's gonna be in higher return places? Mm -hmm. So those are some of the ways in which it might differ from short-term cash transfers. But the others, of course, are in how the, the different things that people choose to do life-wise. Do people go and seek more of an education? That was one of the things that people did in the negative income tax experiments in the United States, um, is that people who did, there, were, there was a small decrease uh, in labor market participation, much, much slighter than I think people expected. Um, but what people did with it was they either spent more time looking for the right job, um, or they sought more qualifications to go out and get a job. Two things that are probably pretty socially beneficial activities. Mm. And I think if you start to see that, you might see bigger returns on those sorts of investments than you might see just in a short-term cash transfer where can't, people can't make those sorts of long-term investments in life returns. Mm. The other thing that you'd, you'd wonder about is if children are growing up in families that are gonna be guaranteed a cash payment over 12 years, um, what does that do for sort of stress levels in the family, general security in the family, health of every member of the family, and what does that do for the outlook of those children? And so one of the things that you want to look at is do you start to see bigger gains in the long run because of the security that you're able to provide? Yeah, for sure. Now, basic income, uh, welfare, these kinds of programs traditionally are seen as, I would say, by most people as the province of the state. Um, they'll give directly, obviously, uh, an NGO operating in this space. Uh, how do you work with governments? Will you be working with governments and have governments expressed interest in the results of your trial uh, that they might want to then use it in their own constituencies? Yeah, I mean, we, we always, wherever we work, we have to coordinate well with, with local government. I think it's just important to running a successful program to make sure that you know, you're speaking to each other and that you have the blessing of the local government yeah. where you're operating. So we always do that and we're doing that here. Um, there is interest among uh, governments out there, particularly among sort of the, the economists out there, to look at the results of this. Um, we've been talking to policymakers in multiple governments around the world uh, and have gotten positive response from a lot of them. Um, I think that the responses from them have been in looking probably at the pieces of it. Um, it. You know, people have talked about how affordable it is to run a basic income, you know, in certain countries. There are some middle income countries where it actually is reasonably affordable to do almost in its broadest form. I think Brazil is one of those where uh, if you break down the numbers, it actually becomes reasonably affordable and, and Brazil actually has a law in the books where they're supposed to be looking at ramping up something like this. Um, in other countries, doing it in its fullest form is much more of a budgetary challenge. Um, and I think that those countries are probably looking at how effective cash transfers generally and broad-based cash transfers can be um, and universality in certain circumstances can be over other in-kind programs. We hope to sort of advance the lessons on that as well. Mm. Um, now, I guess, uh, of course, we've talked a lot about the benefits. What are some of the risks? Um, uh, could we see localised inflation? Could we see uh, sort of uh, differences between the control group and the treatment group where uh, either the, you know, one, one of the groups uh, sees that the other has considerably more money, uh, leading to, you know, food hoarding and things like that? I mean, these are some of the risks, I think, that, that uh, people have, have posited. What are you worried about? What could, go, what could go horribly wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges right off the bat is um, if you're going to tell people that you're giving them money over 12 years and you want to look at sort of what different you know, sort of decisions they make, they have to trust that you're actually going to be doing that. Yeah. And I think that's one of the most immediate challenges, right, is, is generating that level of trust. Um, 
what, one of the ways that we're trying to mitigate that is that we're actually not going to be, you know, tracking answers from people until after about a year or so into the study. So hopefully we will build up a good track record. Um, we're also going to look to operate in places where Give Directly has a reputation for being able to deliver. Um, but that's one of the things that will really be a challenge is if people don't actually believe that they're going to get it, then you won't get the kind of the kind of research that you want. Um, in terms of sort of other risks on inflation and prices, we're actually running another study right now to look at sort of the general equilibrium effects of cash transfers. When you, know, when you saturate an area with cash transfers, what does that do to prices to inflation labor markets? We sh we, the, the midline data from that has just come and it's being analyzed now, um, we're going to be looking at that so that that'll help inform, you know, sort of questions on this side as well. Um, and then lastly, you know, sort of in terms of working, you know, sort of, you know, with, with governments and them adopting some of this, I think it's interesting whether in, in some of these places a charity like Give Directly that has a reputation on the ground of delivering stuff has more or less trust yeah, um, than some sure. of the local governments out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's another question that's sort of interesting to figure out. I think in this place, because we'll be in a place where we've been before, we're, we're in a pretty good space where people do have, I think, a good, a good trust in the track record. Yeah, organization. excellent. Okay, well, um, I'll just uh, bring up some of the questions that we've uh, got from the audience, but um, if we don't manage to get through all of these, um, just to remember that you know, it'll be next door um, just after this talk if you would like to ask some further questions. Um, so let's have a look. Uh, okay, so first questions. Okay, it turns out we've actually covered many of these. Uh, so, yep, no, <laughs> that's, yeah, I've, I've anticipated too many of these questions. Um, so is there, so one, one question we've got here is, is there an income threshold at which point people might have enough uh, capital to lift themselves up indefinitely, uh, so lift themselves up by their bootstraps, uh, the phrase used, rather than relying on aid indefinitely, um, you know, sort of outside of the, uh, the the UBI experiment, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is sort of the fundamental yeah. debate, you know, sort of yeah. whether you're trying to graduate people out of a program, and I think that the there's there's going to be a second order set of policy questions that um, if this proves that the sky does not fall. Right, which is which is really the first order of business, um, and people start looking about at policy designs. There are questions about: Do you phase it out at certain points? Then it become then you get back into that problem of welfare, you know, sort of traps and, and cliffs. Um, there are there are proposals that maybe you would give it to everybody, um, but you would tax it uh, heavily on people above a certain amount. Um, mm -hmm. I think those questions are are more for policymakers after. Um, we're able to produce some evidence as to what the general impact of basic income is, and there are some really difficult questions to answer once you get to that point. But at this stage, I think we're not looking at kind of the targeted uh, transfers. We're looking at what happens when you do it, you know, sort of sure. universally. Um, no, uh, one great question here is uh, how are you going to keep track of people who are in either group? Because of course, people might migrate out of the village. They might uh, migrate back into a, a treatment village. Uh, how are you going to differentiate between those groups uh, over the long term? So we will allow people to migrate out of the village. I think one of the possible impacts of a basic income is that people decide that they have the security to go perhaps to places where there's a broader job market. Um, so it's important to pick that up. Um, we won't provide a basic income to people who migrate into the village um, for obvious reasons. In the real world, when you're not doing an experiment, you've got immigration laws to deal with uh, people playing sort of benefit arbitrage. Um, we don't control the immigration laws here, so you'd end up with a problem where people you know, all flock to the village to collect a basic income. So we can't allow people to, to come into the village and collect it. In terms of how we track people where, where they go, um, nice thing about this, we will be making the payments by digital mobile payments to people's cell phones. Um, so one, they'll have something with them and they will have an incentive to stay in touch, <laughs> which is that they're going to be collecting over time. Um, but there are also uh, some research methods that have been developed from some of the other long-term studies out there. So Ted McGill's 12-year uh, deworming study was able to track people amazingly, even if they migrated to different places. So the research team is, is taking some of the lessons from that program to be able For to track sure. people. Um, are you looking into some of the, uh, we, we talked about the, the, the role of government, but what about the political effects of something like this? So do you think that this might uh, lead to uh, an increase in uh, government accountability or reduce account, uh, government accountability in any case? So one of the things that the, the general equilibrium study that we're also working on is looking at is what's the impact on sort of, you know, uptake of public services. Um, you know, and I think that there will be opportunities here to also look at uh, public spending, you know, sort of changes. What are sort of the broad-based changes in a community? Um, 
my understanding, and I haven't looked closely into this, someone here may have, uh, is that there hasn't been a dramatic impact in cash transfer situations on people's perception of the responsibility of political officials. Um, we've had some people reach out to us wanting to do some more research on that. I think it'd be uh, interesting further research to do if the studies that are out there haven't fully covered the landscape. Right. So just to, to expand on that, people see a fairly sharp distinction between give directly the NGO and, and service provision from the government? Correct. Yeah. I, 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 we, we've, I'm not aware of anyone thinking that the things that we've done have led to impacts on popularity or lack of popularity of, of local sure. officials. Um, now, if you receive more um, funding for the initial pilot program, would you expand it? Um, so you've talked about going from uh, the 200 to the 300, uh, but would you uh, go for a longer period of time? Would you expand to different countries? Well, I, I like the ambition <laughs> yep. and I like the confidence that we're going to get to where yep. we need to go. Um, we've, so we've got about $8 million or so left to raise by the end of the year. Um, one of the things that I, you know, I, I love about Give Directly and I think about, is exciting about this is normally this type of research uh, is hatched in you know, academia, think tanks, halls of government. It's not participatory. Um, we very much believe in the participatory nature of the work that we do. I'm sure a lot of people either in this room at this conference um, have been helpful to Give Directly families. Um, so the, the, to get the rest of the way, um, we've got a website, givedirectly.org slash basic income, where really the amount that it takes to provide a basic income where we'll be operating is incredibly small. It's a dollar a day, um, and that's essentially somebody's basic income. So we've got a, a great group of supporters who are providing a dollar a day to one of the recipients, um, and then people on sort of the larger end who are taking an entire village, um, which is really only about $50,000 a year uh, over the course of the, of the project. So we want people to participate in it, not just as funders, but also in following the project. I mean, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens over time uh, in these villages. And so we're setting up a way uh, we'll have an online tool where people can actually follow what happens in these villages over time and get updates regularly on how things are playing out. Um, so we're, we're looking to roll that out uh, towards the end of this year. Excellent. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are out of time, so we'll have to leave it there. But um, can you please uh, join me in thanking Ian for his time? Thank you. And as I've said, if you've got any more questions, I'm sorry I wasn't get to all, uh, able to get to all of them, but Ian will be next door uh, for the next few minutes, so if you do have any further questions, then um, yeah, please go and have a chat. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks guys.